Thank you. I'm <clears throat> delighted to be here. I can't actually see anyone, so that's, that's probably working to my advantage. Um, <clears throat> so genius loves company. I want to begin by just talking a little bit about my background and how I approach that prompt or that topic. I'm an anthropologist and an art historian uh, teaching at Connecticut College. And as part of my work, I'm mostly interested in the reception of art and what I would call the production of art historical knowledge. That is, what happens after art is made? How does art enter the marketplace or the museum? How is the canon of art history constructed? And uh, really, who determines what is good art or bad art and what is great art or the art of genius? So for me, the question of genius is in fact, as I'll try to talk about today, not a measurable truth. It's not an objective fact. Uh, to me, it's a very mediated construct. It's uh, largely based on such factors as gender, race, class, and the economy of taste. And I think when we study the artist genius, it tells us far less about any individual artist or any individual work of art, and it tells us far more about the cultural hierarchy and power structure in which genius is identified, celebrated, and ultimately entrenched in the art history textbooks that we use to teach. So think about it for a minute. When you think of the word genius artists, what comes to mind? Male, white, self-consumed, isolated and alone, disheveled and haughty, alcoholic or perhaps even mad, and ideally with strong chiseled male features. Or in other words, Kirk Douglas in the 1956 <coughs> film Lust for Life, where he portrayed Vincent Van Gogh. Movie representations of artist geniuses tend to be repetitious and celebrate the same themes again and again, whether we consider Ed Harris's convincing role as Pollock in the 2000 film, or the fictitious Lionel Dobie played by Nick Nolte in Scorsese's 1989 short film, Life Lessons, an artist genius in this film fueled by heavy liquor, heavy jealousy, and heavy sexual rage. The image of the individual artist genius as a timeless and self-evident truth is, in my view, largely a myth. If indeed genius loves company, then for me, the company is not the, col the um, collaborative efforts that may go into producing a work of art, but rather it's the whole network of art critics, dealers, museums, and scholars who mobilize and manipulate the category of perception to identify a genius um, at, through an evaluative lens, which is in fact highly distorted and not very pure. Now the public perception of the artist genius as this sort of empirical fact rather than a construct is not only found in the masculine tantrums of film stars, but also in the more sober realm of museum exhibitions. <laughs> Museums routinely celebrate the art of white male geniuses, often by conveniently reminding us in the title of the show that the artist is a genius. Da Vinci, the genius, a traveling exhibition that originated a few years ago in Australia. Salvador Dali, mind of a genius, <clears throat> another traveling show that's been making the rounds in Taipei and Singapore. Or Charles James, Genius Deconstructed, an exhibition last year at the Chicago History Museum, which took the unusual step of making touchable reproductions of gowns and dresses because, says the curator, the genius is on the inside. If you can't see or touch it, then you won't understand what it is. So how exactly do you see genius? What does it mean to touch a fabric and recognize the aura of artistic genius? Being a good artist or a great artist, I would say, is a matter of talent or skill. But being a genius artist involves something quite a bit more. It is not an individual talent, um, a special gift for creative ability or art making. Being a genius artist is a way of thinking about artists. It's a way of packaging and, and presenting art to a wider public a frame of mind, a set of practices, or what I would call a social construction. To declare an artist as genius is to engage in a performative linguistic act that bestows power and authority not only in the artist, whose status has been greatly elevated by that declaration, but also, and perhaps even more, it's a mark of distinction on the person who identifies that artist as a genius, 
what we call in art history the gifted eye, uh, someone who recognizes the art of genius. Now, there are many examples in the history of Europe and America's encounter with African art that I find interesting in terms of elucidating this point about the discovery of genius in the shadows of the artistic world. Um, let's consider a recent example. Last summer, a mask, which you see on the screen, <coughs> was offered for sale in Paris at a special auction held for this single object. It was first acquired around 1912 by a legendary French dealer named Paul Guillaume, who had sold, incidentally, to Picasso and Modigliani as well. It was then sold in the 1920s to author, poet, and founding father of surrealism, André Breton, and ultimately purchased by another very well-known African art dealer in France, Charles Raton. The mask was photographed in 1927 by none other, none other than Man Ray in Breton's Paris apartment, and an image of the mask was included in a book um, from 1934 by Nancy Cunard uh, called Negro Anthology. The mask then mysteriously disappeared from view and was rediscovered 80 years later. So the story of this mask, as told in the auction house narrative, this narrative that went into this one day, one, one object sale, was all about the gifted eye, the ability of men like Guillaume and, and Breton and Raton to recognize artistic genius and to rescue this object from the, from the fringes of France's colonial empire. Yet, I think what's missing in this whole narrative is the African carver who made the mask the genius of the African hand that created it, the colonial subject that made it. But in some ways, that anonymous hand doesn't fit into our Western art historical thinking about the mythology of the artist's genius. But men like Guillaume, Breton, and Raton are pressed into service as substitutes for the artist's genius. It is they who deserve credit for recognizing the greatness of this mask, and it is they ultimately that drove up the market value of this piece. The piece was estimated at $100,000 to $150,000, and it was sold to an unidentified buyer, or should I say genius, <coughs> for $1.5 million. Um, so its legacy of the gifted eye continues. Another productive strategy, I think, to explore this idea that I have that genius is not a social fact, but is, is in fact a social construction, is to look at two works of art that are very similar and, um, and compare them uh, side by side. Both of these landscapes that you see with cows share a common theme. They share a similar style. And I would say they're closely related in terms of their color palette. While there may be some variations in the handling of the paint or the dexterity of the brush, in general, their similarities certainly far outweigh their differences. The painting on the left, entitled C Cattle at Rest, is by British child prodigy Kieran Williamson, who painted it in 2014 at age 12. He was declared a genius um, at age five, and his reputation has grown steadily ever since. Today, his paintings command upwards of $10,000 a piece, and they usually sell out, his shows sell out within minutes of, of the opening. Now, those who are buying the pieces from, uh, from Kieran Williamson may be doing so because his skill certainly outweighs um, or out, out, out is better than his age would exp than you would expect, or they may be investing in what they hope is the next genius, like artists like Picasso or Clay, who are also child geniuses. The painting on the right was completed in 1910. The artist was 21 years old at the time, and his name is Adolf Hitler. Rejected twice by the Academy of Fine Arts in Vienna in 1907 and 1908, Hitler, the artist, as we know, was of no consequence to the history of art. Yet, if we look at these objects side by side, purely objectively as visual comparisons, we, are, we would be hard pressed to say that one is the work of a genius and one obviously is not. Viewing genius, this idea of genius as socially constructed, helps us better understand, I think, the unequal distribution of geniuses in the art world. Why is there such a predominance of white male uh, geniuses and a paucity of women artists, artists of color, or artists from historically marginalized groups? 
Genius in the art world celebrates the few, the success of the few over the many, and in a way the structures of genius, the idea that it is somehow a natural phenomenon that can't be achieved, excludes many other uh, categories of people. So, so where does the concept of the artist genius stand today? I would say that in recent years there have been two different forces challenging and eroding the concept of the artist genius and throwing into question the old limitations of who qualified within this hierarchy as, as a genius. On the one hand, popular culture has certainly embraced the word genius in art, and we tend to use it very loosely today to say that people are geniuses. Um, take, for example, this recent online discovery of a genius makeup artist who transforms her lips into cartoon characters, which, okay, I've got to admit, that is genius. Um, <laughs> Examples like this, though, mark a wider trend in sort of crowd curating and public appropriation of the word genius as applied to artists, and in a way, the overuse of that word sort of dilutes the, 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 the power of the word genius and in a way makes it um, essentially meaningless within the art historical world. On the other hand, over the past few decades, the canon of art history itself has been opening up to artists um, who have been traditionally excluded from participation in the mainstream art historical discourse. Beginning in the late 70s, activists from the feminist community, like the Guerrilla Girls, engaged in a vocal campaign of institutional critique that shed a bright light on the gaps and the missing characters, missing figures within the art world. In one of their great iconic posters, The Advantages of Being a Woman Artist, they list, with typical biting satire, 13 advantages to not being a white male artist, reason number 12, not having to undergo the embarrassment of being called a genius. Artists who in the past would have been structurally excluded from participation in this category of genius, such as Chris Ophelia or Kahinda Wiley, have responded, I think, in different ways. Chris Ophelia, uh, for example, early in his career, thumbed his nose at the canon of the artist genius by responding with work, works like Shithead of 1993, a crude uh, clump of elephant dung fashioned into a human face topped with dreadlocks, an image that I would say flips off the Western canon of art historical genius and throws mud, or rather dung, in its eye. Kahinda Wiley, on the other hand, is engaged directly with the Western canon of the artist genius by reclaiming it as his own and refashioning the image to reflect different values, different communities, and different voices. The genius in a work like Wiley's massive canvas, The Chancellor of Seguier on Horseback from 2005, is not to be found in the genius of its execution, um, but rather um, it, his ability to reinterpret a 17th century uh, portrait of Pierre Seguier and give it a new cultural engagement, a new social relevance, his ability to shatter boundaries and to reframe the social structure of the artistic genius itself. In his recent book on the cultural landscape of gangland, gangland Chicago, Harvard professor Ralph, uh, Lawrence Ralph writes, the genius in Wiley's work is that it leads us to question why can't urban African Americans assume the delicate harmony and militant posture reminiscent of a Renaissance master. So, to conclude, the next time you are shown a painting, sculpture, or some other work of art, and told that it's the work of an artistic genius, what are you going to do? Close your eyes. Don't look at the art right away. Look around the edges, inspect the social structure, interrogate the framework, question the assumptions, and look beyond the shadows of your own preconceptions. Where is this art being displayed? Who is declaring it to be genius? What is the narrative or art historical story with which um, we are being presented and with which the work of art is being framed? And once you've explored that full context, dismantled that social construction, explored the parameters of inherent bias, then open your eyes and look at the work of art. You are now liberated from these constraints of canonical prejudice, and you're free, hopefully, to decide for yourself whether it is indeed a work of genius. Thank you. <laughs>